Welcome to the presentation. Um, uh, this is all about uh, the biogeography of um, what most people call Florida milkweed. I'm trying to call it Florida fairy milkweed for a specific reason, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but first, before we get into you know milkweeds and milkweed ecology and th things like that, I kind of I wanted to go into um, a little bit about what biogeography is, so that everybody kind of has a little bit of an understanding of um, what's involved with that kind of research. So, biogeography basically studies a wide variety of aspects, but it's primarily related to um, geographic distributions of species, of ecosystems and things like that. And it's a very um, integrative field that uh, uses um, concepts from a lot of different fields, again, um, such as what's listed on the screen, like especially for plants, geology, physical geography, definitely ecology, and sometimes evolutionary biology, depending on you know, what the, uh, scientists are researching. To the right, we have a, a map of um, the different subspecies of uh, white-tailed deer. And for Florida, we actually have um, three subspecies. Um, one's the Osceola subspecies, which I think is number 24. Um, number 27 is the Seminole subspecies. And then number six right at the bottom is our federally listed key deer. So some of the concepts in biogeography, and this is just mainly with animals, um, or one of the big concepts in biogeography is that species and uh, ecosystems vary uh, pretty regularly along different kinds of geographic gradients, such as elevation. So basically the higher up in elevation you, on a mountain you go, you're seeing um, kind of similar community structure, so, uh, species with similar adaptations. Um, latitude, you know, um, and etc. So for deer, to continue this example, there's two uh, rules for animals that are widely used in biogeography. So the first is Bergman's rule. So um, widespread species uh, in higher or at least uh, more northern or colder climates tend to be larger, and that's mainly for conserving body heat. And um, species in warmer climate climates tend to be smaller. So uh, in the upper right corner, you can see that the average size of an adult deer in Florida is about 125 pounds, but in Idaho, 250 to 300 pounds. That's more than double the, or yeah, more than double the size of our deer in Florida. Um, and then there's Foster's rule, which is, you know, AKA the island effect, where animal species either get bigger or smaller based on, you know, what resources are available on the island. And key deer, are a prime example of that rule. So those are just two kind of more animal-centric um, concepts in biogeography. For plant geography or phytogeography, we kind of look at um, uh, things a little bit differently. And we kind of focus on the pattern of the distribution of plants um, or plant communities across the landscape at different scales. Sometimes it's at a small scale, like at the Naples Preserve. Sometimes it's at a scale of like peninsular Florida, or as in the case of the map above, worldwide. There's four major concepts that are um, covered, and that's plant ecology and ecology is kind of the study of interactions between uh, different species and their ecosystem. Paleobotany, which studies um, the plants of the past and couple that with geography, it's the distribution of those ancient plants. There's plant geography, which again, you know, what kinds of, um, what's the geographic distribution of those plants? And then plant sociology, which focuses more on plant communities and different associations with that. An example right here we have on this screen is our native uh, hickory. We have about like I think about three species of hickory in Florida. One of those is the scrub hickory, which you can see in the nice photograph there. The other extant species or existing species is um, I think uh, Chinese hickory, um, which it's kind of hard to tell, but under the, um, you can kind of see the map of where Chinese hickory can be found um, in dark gray here. 
Um, and what's interesting about that is, you know, this question that scientists will ask is, you know, why do we have a whole bunch of different hickory species, but, you know, in China, we have a couple of different species of hickory. How did they make that jump from North America to China? So those are the kinds of questions that they ask when it comes to uh, plants and geography. So for the Southeast, um, the basic elements of, or at least, um, excuse me, the basic data elements of phytogeography are based, are pretty much occurrence records. And those are pretty much uh, a botanist going out into the wild, finding a plant or a bunch of different plants, pressing them and recording where he found them, recording the date, recording notes, etc. And those records are used to construct um, kind of, again, floristic provinces or defined habitats and communities. And to the right, you'll see a bunch of different um, habitats or zones where we're finding similar groups of species or similar lists of species. Oops. And right here is a photograph from, that I took a when I was doing a contract work in Big Cypress a couple years ago. Um, this kind of illustrates to an extent um, one aspect of phytogeography, which is you know, plant communities. And you can kind of see how um, each, so all of those hills out there are cypress domes. And those indicate a change in um, the underlying geology. Um, that's, those are places where the limestone has been eaten away by the rain. And so the cypress trees are allowed to grow much taller. Um, in the areas between that, there's a different kind of, or a different set of plants there. So this is kind of an illustration of how plant communities shift and change as you move across the landscape. And to the right here is an example of how um, somebody would map those communities out on a map or delineate them, so to speak. So this is kind of getting a little bit more into what I'm studying for, for my thesis. Um, and a plant community is basically a group of plant species that are often found together that's distinctive from other communities or habitats. And it's most often in a smaller scale than a, a, a region like Peninsular Florida, for example, or a county. Um, these communities are relatively kind of, are relatively uniform and they're influenced by uh, factors, uh, mainly soil type or uh, overall topography, climate, hydrology, or um, in, or disturbance. And in ecology, we use disturbance to refer to things like fire or hurricanes or uh, somebody or like an animal coming through and disturbing the soil, etc. And the key thing here is that a plant community can be rare even if none of the species that are in it are rare. And that's because all the conditions that came together to make it um, are really unique or special and not very common. Um, so we're going to start transitioning here. So um, I want to talk a little bit about biodiversity hotspots. Now, biodiversity is basically a measure of, well, there's different ways of measuring biodiversity, but um, the way it's used here, it's just a count of the number of species or can be a count of the number of species in a particular area. But a biodiversity hotspot is an area with high endemism um, and habitat loss. And endemism basically means that the plants and animals and species found there are found nowhere else in the world. So for the Southeast, which is where we're located, um, the, in 2016, the Southeast was recognized as um, the 36th most biodiverse hotspot in the world. Um, and it has over 1,500 endemic species and over 70% habitat loss. Yeah. Um, I think the major ecosystem for the Southeast is the longleaf pine ecosystem. And if I remember correctly, um, it's not, it's way more than 70%. It's more like 95, 96 plus percent. Um, there's very, very little um, intact habitat remaining. Um, and uh, as an aside, there's still species being described and found here um, in this region. So it, it's just one of the, 
the Southeast and Florida especially is just, there's all kinds of cool stuff that's still being described and found even today. And these are some photographs I took. This is up in the panhandle of Florida um, in one of the uh, wet prairies up there. Um, and the species density of plants can ex uh, pee about a hundred uh, species per square meter. It's pretty crazy. So finally on to milkweeds. Um, so there's about 17 um, milkweed species uh, found only in the coastal plain. Two of those species are found in Florida, only. Um, on the left, you have savanna milkweed, which um, is mainly found in Florida and kind of barely extends up into Georgia and South and North Carolina. Our two uh, species here are Curtis's milkweed, which is only found in a special type of habitat here called Florida scrub. It's found in 21 counties in Florida. And again, it's endemic, no, found nowhere else outside of Florida. And it's state listed as endangered. Our other endemic species is Florida milkweed, um, or as I'm trying to call it, is Florida fairy milkweed. Um, it's less understood and less studied than um, Curtis's milkweed. And in 2017, the Florida Native Plant Society attempted to petition the Florida Endangered Plant Advisory Council um, to list it as uh, threatened, which um, that was tabled pending further research, which is where I come in. <laughs> I decided to study um, the habitat of the species to, and, and try to assess its population to see if it's worth listing. Um, I submitted a second petition um, late last year and um, at the meeting about a week and a half ago, uh, the uh, advisory council voted to list this as state threatened, um, which is pretty exciting because um, I, I honestly wasn't expecting that. Uh, Richard, I will gladly answer that uh, at the end of uh, the presentation. But um, the next step here after uh, listing or after they vote is to vote to confirm it, at which point the um, list of new species to go on our enda or endangered plant list is going to put before the Florida legislature, which um, they typically automatically vote uh, to include, you know, additions or uh, subtractions to that list. So by next year, it should be officially listed as threatened in Florida. So in general, milkweeds are, in my opinion, I think they're super cool. They're probably my favorite genus of plants. And, um, you know, I think they're just fascinating in general. But um, they're a group of uh, charismatic plants. They're typically found in grasslands or grassland-like ecosystems in North America and Africa. And there's about 130 species overall in North America. Um, most species, tend to prefer um, habitats with um, relatively open canopy with, um, or just habitats that allow bright, full sunlight. Um, most species are perennial and die back uh, during the winter time. And when they regrow, they don't, um, they don't really overgrow or uh, they're not like uh, certain species of shrubs or vines that will just grow continuously until winter time at which they die back they kind of tend to reach a maximum size before they die back at the end of the year. Um, and there's anecdotal evidence that a lot of our upland species will um, um, a minimum age of about 25 years. And I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of our native species that make tap roots and tubers like this do live to be very, very old. Um, personally, I think some of them can be old, you know, well over 50 plus years or more. Um, I tell you this, I so really old many species of milkweeds are adapted to, again, a disturbances such as fire, uh, grazing, and m much more rarely soil disturbance. So milkweeds are also high quality nectar plants for a wide variety of insects. And besides uh, monarchs and queens, um, and soldier butterflies, 
Milkweeds are also host to a, a wide or a decent amount of other uh, species adapted for solely feeding on milkweed. Um, some of those examples are milkweed bugs, that, which are native, um, and they tend to like uh, you know, eating seeds and seed pods. And then there's um, milkweed beetles as well. Um, and there's several different species of milkweed beetles. This is to say that milkweeds in general can almost form their own little mini ecosystem around themselves. Um, so a little bit about reproduction, and this is, this is part of the reason why I find them so fascinating. Um, and as an aside, I was originally gonna try to do a, a reproductive ecology study on milkweeds just because I found them so fascinating. But um, when people uh, think about uh, plant reproduction or pollination, this is what they picture is a bumblebee or an insect kind of uh, heading to a flower, getting nectar, and then kind of rubbing themselves all over or getting dusted with pollen that uh, is then, um, you know, transferred to another nearby flower. That's not what happens at all with milkweeds. Milkweeds don't do this. Um, milkweeds are weird. <laughs> In fact, there are actually a lot, I don't know how many of you are familiar with orchids and how, um, how their pollen is packaged, but um, milkweeds in, are kind of like orchids in that their pollen is packaged in these nice little uh, wax covered packets, but they also have a weird floral morphology. So at the bottom here are the, the petals um, or what's called the corolla. And the top is called the corona because it looks like a crown. Um, in the corona, you have the hood and horns, which are the nectaries, and nectar is secreted at the base of the horn. Um, and then this is where all the business happens. This is the st stigmatic slit. And then up the top here, you have this little black button called a corpusculum, which uh, we're not going to get too far into this, but essentially um, when an insect comes to visit um, milkweed, they're wanting to get at the nectaries, but the outside of the uh, corona is waxy and slippery, and so they can't really grab onto it very well. Those um, hoods actually guide the insect's legs in between um, the, the hoods, and the legs will get caught in that stigmatic slit, and in order to get it out, the insect has to pull its leg out, and because a lot of bugs have those little hooks on their legs, it gets hooked on the corpusculum and it ends up pulling out um, the milk colonia. And on the um, right there is an example of polinia pulled out by me. So when these are pulled out, they're normally kind of flat and they're laying at about 180 degrees. And after like a minute or two, they tend to rotate into position or at an angled position. So you can kind of see that happening there. Um, and this is important because that delay um, prevents it from self-pollinating. And I'll get to why that, um, why preventing self-pollination is important for milkweeds. But each species has a different kind of pollinia. And so in some ways it functions almost as a lock and key, um, which prevents hybridization between species. It can, hybrids can happen. They're just really, really rare. I've only ever seen one example of that in Florida, and it's in one location <laughs> up in the panhandle. Um, I know there's an herbarium specimen uh, of hybrid between uh, Florida milkweed and Savannah milkweed, which I would love to find that one day, but you know, it's kind of a pipe dream at this point. Um, anyway, so here's a video that I took of um, to kind of illustrate how an insect will forage and actually pull the pollinia out. It's really done a lot of things out here. They're out here. And as you, as you watch this, you, you'll notice that, you know, if this wasp has a whole bunch of different um, pollinia on its legs. Um, oh, you can see it. Did you see that? Yeah. And you can see how the, in, like, it can't really grab onto the outside. It, it uh, the legs are kind of slid in between. And so it ends up oftentimes um, having multiple um, pollinia on its legs, which for those of you who do uh, garden for uh, 
monarch butterflies, wasps, and bees are major, wasps especially are major pollinators of a bunch of different species of milkweed. You've got more the hairs on So this is um, an example of it on Florida milkweed, which is really, really tough to see. And I didn't catch it until like a year later <laughs> when I was looking at the video again. But um, this is, I think, I don't know what species of wasp, I'm not an entomologist, but this is an insect that actually managed to get it on its mouth parts. But it just goes to show you that um, a wide variety of insect species actually um, visit milkweeds. And a wide variety of insects are successful um, pollinators of milkweeds. Excuse me, it's not just butterflies and bees. Um, in some species, it's even beetles. And I wouldn't even be surprised if there were flies that were also pollinating it too, but that's more research required. Um, one caveat for some insects is that they have to be big enough and strong enough in order to re remove themselves. Otherwise, they, they're in for a not fun time. <laughs> um, so these are all photographs I took of just um, Florida milkweed. And these are, were all dead insects that I found yeah. um, because they could not uh, pull themselves out of the, the flower. So this kind of speaks to um, each species of milkweed uh, needing like a specific, not like a specific species, but a specific group of pollinators, if that makes sense. So that's it. Right there on the right, it's a close call. <laughs> Got out, but I had to um, So quick aside here, um, milk, <laughs> all this said, <laughs> Milkweed pollination uh, is like is there's a low percent chance for each flower to be successfully pollinated. I think um, I, I use the rule of thumb for every 100 flowers, you get one seed pod. Um, and that percent or the percent chance for each flower uh, turning into a seed pod varies for uh, different species. Um, I went through one study where one species had a 0.0%. .0 per 0.02% chance per flower to be successfully pollinated. Um, another one had as high as 7% chance, but that's still really low compared to other species. The trade-off is, is that once they get pollinated though, all that they have exactly enough pollen to pollinate all the, the ovules in their ovaries. And so they'll have a full seed pod of like, you know, anywhere between, depending on the species, you know, 30 to over 100 seeds. So here's a, excuse me, an example of successful pollination. You know, good job. You did it. Congratulations. Woo. And here's what that looks like for Florida milkweed. And once it's in that, once the uh, pollinia is in that stigmatic slit, there's like um, uh, kind of neck, a little bit of a uh, nectary or sugary substance in there that stimulates uh, the growth of pollen tubes. And I'm not going to get into that part because that gets a little bit too complicated even for me. Um, but essentially the pollen granules will germinate in order to fertilize the ovules in the ovary and etc. <laughs> so when um, milkweeds are pollinated, you can tell pretty early off the bat. They will start recurving on themselves and, and the um, pedestal of the flower, the little flower stem there will thicken up and you'll start to see the development of a seed pod. Plus they can't, they can't pollinate themselves. So it has to be so, more than one plant in bloom, right? So anecdotal evidence basically, you know, mostly for me, suggests that um, seeds for Florida milkweed probably have high germination rates and um, they may have slow growth rates compared to a uh, scrub species, which again is uh, Curtis's milkweed. But in general, milkweeds have a really high uh, germination rate. Um, it's just they have to survive from seedling to, um, you know, kind of, or they have to survive germination to establish themselves as seedlings. And that's a whole different uh, kind of ecology that we're not going to cover today. Um, and that's what I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, milkweeds uh, from up north and the big uh, seed pods that uh, have fluff everywhere. Um, well, some of our species aren't as uh, big and showy, so. 
Um, so most milkweeds are not self-compatible and that's, that goes back to um, the pollinia before. That's to prevent uh, that adaptation where it has to rotate into position to be reinserted um, is to kind of delay the chance or uh, decrease the chance of self-pollination or self-pollination because self-pollination results in, um, you know, it's, so, bleh, excuse me, milkweeds basically suffer from inbreeding depression. So if they try to self, it's not going to develop or the seed pod's going to abort. Or if you have a parent and a sibling cross, you're going to get lower overall seed set. Um, if you have, or even, you know, a sibling, sibling cross. So it, if a species had, can make up to 150 seeds, you're probably going to see maybe half that or less. Um, that's just kind of a, a guesstimate on my part. Um, but because of the fact that there's this delay and you have a very wide variety of insect species foraging on um, most milkweed species, this makes pollination within a population random which is just, to me, like, it's so mind-blowing <laughs> to think about that fact because, you know, you don't have to have two milkweeds next to each other in order to have successful crosses. You can have two milkweeds, you know, over here, and then 20 yards away you have three milkweeds, and then 10 yards in another direction you have, you know, 20 milkweeds or something. And so the, the chance of them all being pollinated in that area is um, pretty much equally likely due to the fact that different insects forage differently at different times, et cetera. So it's, it's all super fascinating. Um, another thing to think about too, is that because the pollinia is in a nice little package, that means that a lot of, so most insects will forage for pollen because it's a nice uh, nutrient rich food. Um, because milkweed pollinia is in a little package, insects can't eat it. So they'll fly off and forage elsewhere. Sometimes um, there's at least one study that noted um, uh, genetics from an outside population that was over a kilometer away coming into their study population. And they had actually taken the time to genetically sequence all 50 something individuals in the population they were studying. So there was a, the offspring that was made. Um, I think they said about like 10 or 15% uh, of the genes came from outside of that population, which is pretty fascinating to me and gets into that whole spatial ecology thing with biogeography, right? Anyway, <laughs> it's a lot of talk there. And I, I'm into this because again, I originally was gonna do a reproductive ecology study, so. Um, milkweeds in general, uh, because a lot of different insects forage on them, they more than likely depend upon um, habitat heterogeneity, or in other words, living in a, a fully connected landscape with lots of different habitats and microhabitats that support a really wide variety of insect species. Um, and again, those patchy populations at various distances help um, with that, those genes. So remember what I said before with the genes from an outside population coming in to a population? That helps maintain um, overall genetic diversity and helps um, reduce um, the chances, or at least, um, you know, basically it prevents um, or helps prevent uh, sibling crosses and related. So it prevents them from having, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm drawing a blank. Basically helps make their seeds uh, more viable. Um, and in general, um, most studies cite that uh, the most successful pollinators for uh, studied milkweeds or species that have been studied are bees and wasps and then some butterflies. Um, one particular study looked at which insects were visiting it or visiting that species at various distances from uh, tree islands in Big Cyprus. And so the closer, um, and this is a uh, few flower milkweed, you can see it on the right here. Few flower milkweed, the closer it was to tree islands, the wider variety of insects that were visiting it, the higher the chances of it having a seed pod or developing seeds. Um, but out over a hundred yards into the, the prairie um, there, they were only being visited by about three different species of butterfly. 
and you can see those butterflies on the bottom there. So it's almost like this species was kind of having a targeted backup plan of insects that would be guaranteed to visit it no matter where it was at. But if it happened to be growing next to somewhere else, all the better. And if you've never seen this species in the wild, I would say that the flower clusters are about the size, um, like the overall clusters about the size of a silver, silver dollar. And as you can see in that picture, they're kind of uh, cresting the tops of the grasses. So it's like this perfect little platform for big butterflies like um, the swallowtail you see and the, the queen butterfly you see there. So that, all of that said, what do we know about our species, uh, Florida milkweed or Asclepius feii? Um, it's been vouchered in about uh, 18 counties in Florida and there's a new record from St. Lucie County that I was able to confirm uh, this past year. Um, and it's been uh, recorded in a wide variety of habitats. So um, the, which include basically sand hill scrubs, scrubby flatwoods, music flatwoods, and dry prairie. Um, this kind of, if you couple that with what the county distribution map looks like, you would think that it's all over the place, right? Or it seems to imply that it's all over the place in these counties. Some of these counties are really, really big. Well, that's not what I found when I was out there. So um, that said, um, several specimens or several uh, species records were um, recorded them as growing in what's called an ecotone or just a gradient between two different types of habitats. Um, and most of those ecotones are between xeric or dry habitats and mesic or moist slash wet habitats. And on the right here, you can see um, that the area with open sandy patches is scrub and that dark green is kind of like a creek or a seep there where um, water's kind of coming out and it's very moist. Um, all the blue is Curtis's milkweed, the green is Savannah milkweed, and the orange is Florida fairy milkweed. And so you can see that the fairy milkweed is growing in between those two habitats. Um, so based on herbarium specimens alone, it seems to kind of prefer this narrow range of moisture levels. Um, and in one study, they cited it um, as occurring in this kind of weird liminal zone. <laughs> so these are all photographs I took this past uh, summer. Excuse me. This is at Highlands Hammock State Park. And so I recorded it from um, a, a wide variety of habitats. But basically when I went out there, I set up a 10 by 10 meter plot and then kind of gave a basic assessment of what I thought that habitat type was. Then I made a list of all the species that I could identify within that 10 meter by 10 meter plot. I recorded the canopy cover. I counted every single plant there. And um, it, I think, it, yeah, anyway. So, this first one is a xeric oak hammock. Um, and the only reason why it's called a xeric oak hammock is because the canopy was primarily comprised of oaks that were kind of overshadowing this or overshadowing like the overall habitat. But interestingly enough, these plants were occurring in the only spot within this hammock that had an open canopy. Weird, right? Not really. This is what we would now call a xeric oak hammock, but um, the other species in this area um, indicated to me that the only reason why it was an oak hammock was because it was fire suppressed for decades. Um, this uh, was at a county preserve in Hillsborough County, and this past year was the first time they had burned it in decades, and that was when they first saw this species, or Florida fairy milkweed popping up again. So this is in Brevard County at uh, the County Preserve of Wickham Park. Um, this is the only habitat that I recorded as true scrub. And I recorded it as that because it had an overstory of sand pine. And sand pine is a species that's only or strictly found in very, very dry sites or scrub sites. And then here's an example of um, what I would consider scrubby flatwoods. It still has um, sand pine, but it's the sand pine's very, very scattered out here, and it's far more dominated by 
saw palmetto. Um, this is again at Highlands Hammock State Park at a different location. Um, this is this is actually based on an herbarium record, and that herbarium record called this place Turkey Oak Sandhill. And I thought that was kind of weird because if you look on the left, that habitat structure, like the way it looks, looks like a lot of the other places that I have vi I visited. Um, and the only reason why I think they called it Turkey Oak Sandhill is because it had it had Turkey Oak there. Um, and it's very difficult to see. I should have included like a little arrow here, but um, I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, right now, but um, it's in the middle of this uh, grass strip on this dirt road. Um, so here's an example of um, what I would do to count plants is I would flag them. And just so you guys know, uh, if, uh, excuse me, blue flags represent plants that are blooming or reproductive. Pink plants represent adult plants and orange represents juveniles or babies. So this was um, recorded in what I would consider music flatwoods because when I visited this place earlier, I don't know if you guys can see that standing water, but it had standing water um, there for a couple of days that, or it took a couple of days for it to drain. And so music flatwoods kind of is um, denoted um, by that because it has soils that are uh, much more slow to drain. Um, this is something I would call this probably um, something akin to dry flatwoods, but this is at Catfish Creek Preserve State Park um, on uh, one side of the road where they didn't burn. Um, and I just, again, wanted to flag where the plants were on the side of the road just to kind of see. Um, but I hope you all are seeing by now that there's like a distinct like overall shrub height that you see. There's very little canopy. And when you look at the shrubs, there's grassy patches in between the shrubs or there's openings between those shrubs. And that's where you tend to see this plant a lot of the times. So, and I can't remember what which preserve this was at, but um, and it's very difficult to see. Again, I, I probably should have had an arrow in this one too, but there is Florida milkweed in this picture. Um, I just, again, failed to point out with a arrow. Um, this is at Split Oak Wildlife Management Area near Orlando. And I recorded about uh, two populations from here. So, and again, every time I took a habitat picture, I made sure that to include um, the, the plant in the pictures that, so that we can see what the overall habitat looks like. But again, you'll see that it's all shrubs that are basically about knee height or a little bit above, or maybe thigh height with a sparse distribution of trees with spaces in between those shrubs uh, that allow grasses to grow. And um, that's again, typically where you find the species. So to kind of go back to what I was saying before about you know, oh, if it's in this many counties and it's in the, this many kinds of habitats, you would think it's all over the place, right? Well, um, I did a brief, very rudimentary analysis um, last year before I did a lot of my field surveys. And I uh, highlighted the um, three most common habitat types um, in at Babcock Branch Preserve. And you can see the, that on the left, these were all, uh, what I highlighted was primarily, um, you know, scrub, scrubby flatwoods and mesic flatwoods. And mesic flatwoods is all that green. And you can barely see on the bottom here, this turquoise is the scrub and the scrubby flatwoods. It's just like a tiny portion. I then coupled that with um, the most common uh, soil type and rather than soil type, because there's a million different names for soils um, and it's all kind of, <laughs> really confusing to me, I used drainage class. And the most common drainage class that I found um, was um, poorly drained soils. So I highlighted all the poorly drained soils and I kind of overlaid that on top of um, the different habitats this species was found on. And then I subtracted everything else where that intersection didn't happen. And what you see on the right is the result of that. So just by using soil and vegetation, you can see how, <laughs> Basically, these are all um, areas where 
um, we might find this species or Florida fairy milkweed. And again, as you can tell, it's not, um, it significantly reduces the, the area where it might be found. And I'm not gonna go into all these numbers here. This was just um, some of the data that I collected and just averages of it. But the overall, the most common habitat type that I found it in was scrubby flatwoods and, um, and ecotones really, kind of like just an in-between habitat. It was, which is why I call this a liminal species because it's just really difficult to define, you know, which kind of habitat it's in. Excuse me. Um, so it's morphology <laughs> is uh, part of the reason why it's been so uh, difficult to study. And I think also the reason why it's been kind of haphazardly observed and haphazardly sampled. Um, because as you can see on the left picture there, it's very distinctive when in bloom. And frankly, I find it quite pretty and elegant. But on the right, you can barely see it. If there were any less leaf there, um, it wouldn't exist anymore. But um, it doesn't get more than about two feet tall at most. Um, and it has long linear leaves that are typically paired on the stem. And you know that pair kind of alter alternates in orientation. Um, and it's a perennial species. I suspect it's probably a very long lived perennial. Um, and it tends to start growing in about early spring and um, its height is mainly, you know, early spring and summer, and then kind of finishes up by midsummer to fall. And this is just a phenology um, graph taken from iNaturalist. One thing I want you to note is that um, fruiting for this species is pretty low, um, and I'll get to that in a second. So some of those are barium specimens earlier cited a preference for grassy openings. And again, that's what I observed when primarily when I was out collecting data in the field. Um, and the reason why they might be found in those um, little grassy patches is because they provide a suitable um, microclimate or microhabitat that helps establish seedlings. Um, and I find a lot of these plants growing kind of near grassy clumps or within grassy clumps. Um, so they probably act as like a small little nursery to maintain like moisture and things like that. But it also makes them really difficult to find. Um, these pictures were taken in 2017 and um, on the left there is a little uh, milkweed sprout that I had found. And I had, you know, as you can see, it circled, or it circled there. Um, here it is again on Pine Island. Um, I was only able to find this one because it was in bloom. And this is in Alva, Florida. And the flags are all, um, this was before I had established the uh, color codes, um, but the flags denote other plants growing in the grass with it. And then this is in Charlotte uh, County. So um, one thing that I noticed and one of the questions that I was trying to answer is, okay, based on you know, these are barium specimens. It's growing in, you know, saying it's growing in sand hill or it's in flatwoods, it's in scrub, it's in this and this, it's in that. Okay, it's like, okay, which is it? What, what conditions do we find this species growing in? What are the species that are growing with it? Um, and the most common ones are um, found on the left here. Um, they include a uh, fetter bush um, and a uh, stagger bush, tar flower. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with tar flower, but it's a very gorgeous shrub, one of my favorites. Um, Southern bog button. Um, and then you can see uh, photographs of Florida spurge and then dwarf live oak, which is a cool little clonal oak that doesn't get to be more than a foot tall. It's pretty neat. Um, and in Southwest Florida at um, Pine Island, you can find uh, Florida fairy milkweed growing with the federally listed beautiful pawpaw, which it's, as with most of our uh, wildflower species, they're pretty diminutive, um, but produce pretty uh, gorgeous flowers after a fire. So fire ecology. Um, fire in Florida in general, most of Florida's uh, systems that are on, or ecosystems that are on land um, and that aren't, that aren't super swampy um, depend on fire. Um, it's something that happened regularly 
um, for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years in Florida. And our typical fire season happened um, at the end of the dry season. So basically late March, April, May, June is when we would have thunderstorms rolling in, lightning hitting the ground and igniting that dry substrate. And historically, when we didn't have a bunch of roads everywhere, those fires would burn for acres and acres and acres and acres and acres, and acres uninterrupted. And it would act like a lawnmower to kind of keep things, um, especially shrubs from growing out of control. But for some species of plants, it would act as like, oh, it's time to bloom. So um, for Florida milkweed, regular fire, um, because you, as you can see, it's a very like diminutive species. It's not very, um, it's not very robust at all. So if you have shrubs overtaking it, it's not going to do well and it's not going to bloom very well and nobody's going to be able to find it, let alone pollinate it. So fires probably do a very good job of keeping that overall habitat structure um, low, keeping the shrubs knocked back, promoting grass growth and um, wildflower growth so that um, it can grow well and thrive. Um, and because Florida is probably, I'm pretty sure that we're like number one in the nation for conducting prescribed burns, um, but the majority of our prescribed burns are conducted during um, the dry season because they're a little bit easier to manage. Um, and there's um, a lot of land managers have to follow specific regulations like air quality um, and traffic or smoke and traffic and stuff like that. So they stick to dormant season burns um, for that reason. But that's not a good thing because a lot of our species that depend on these fires are typically dormant but shrubs don't stop growing during the winter. So all that ends up doing is favoring shrub growth and the shrubs tend to have like a head start on growth, which over time means that these habitats will see a shift from grasses and wildflowers to mainly woody shrubs. Um, that said, and then not to mention the fact that if this plant makes seeds late summer, early fall, and they're barely germinated by fall or winter, if you put a burn on the ground, you're going to burn all the seedlings before they have a chance to make, you know, tap roots. So um, other researchers have noticed that this species has um, its reproduction or its blooming is stimulated post-burn. And um, about 100% of the, the, the plants in a population or populations that they recorded were, had completed, um, you know, uh, flowering, making fruits and seeds, um, etc., within 100 days of a fire, which is pretty fast. And what I found is I recorded um, whether or not um, a population had been burned that year. Um, and what I found was that plants or populations that had been burned had a higher percentage of adult plants blooming than um, populations that hadn't been burned, which is very interesting. So after a burn, the plants bloom kind of in a staggered fashion um, post-fire, which makes detection difficult um, if you're trying to conduct surveys for it. But this burning is important, and I'm going to go back to reproduction for a second and say that if we think about the fact that one, most milkweed species have a low chance, or you know, rather, if we use the rule of thumb of one in 100 flowers being pollinated successfully and turning into seeds. Um, and two, we consider the fact that a lot of other milkweed species make a whole bunch of flowers in each of their flower clusters. I think um, butterfly milkweed, um, which is the orange one for those of you who aren't familiar with it, makes about 20 to 30 flowers per cluster, and it can make five to 10 plus clusters, depending on the size and age of it. So if you have 10 plants making 10 clusters each of 30 flowers, that's like, that's a lot. And you, you will get a guaranteed amount of, I think roughly, well, you can expect quite a few seed pods just from a population of 10 based on the, you know, the amount of flowers they're putting out. But this species makes, you know, anywhere between one to up to seven flowers. But on average, I saw about five, five flowers per cluster. And it seemed like in populations that hadn't been burned, they were just making less clusters overall. It's like, it's like they weren't even trying, you know? But after a fire, they were just like, okay, 
I'm ready to go. And they just would uh, flush out with flowers and make uh, multiple um, bloom clusters. So it's like the chances of um, making a seed pot are much higher. And, you know, to further cement this, I only ever saw seed pods in populations that had been burned, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. So if this species is only um, making seeds after a fire, and not all preserves and parks are burning or even burning properly, that's probably not a good thing. But here's some photographs I took at Split Oak Preserve. This was about 15 days after they had burned. And you can see how quickly all of these grasses and such are coming, are bouncing back. And yes, indeed, this is uh, Florida milkweed popping back up again. And it's kind of hard to tell, but that little ball in the middle there on the left is actually a very small flower cluster coming in. So, and this is, this is a mega population, uh, probably the biggest one that I had ever found out there, but it had over um, 1300 plants in it. And I have, <laughs> I have never seen that many, but you can see the amount of um, blooming or plants that are about to bloom um, you know, in this population by all the blue flags. So it's, it's pretty awesome. So the overall implications of this kind of this research and this uh, plant in general is that um, scrubby flatwoods and dry prairie and just flatwoods in general are very um, broad habitat categories. Um, and they're not homogenous, really. But um, the species composition of these probably is likely unique and it likely varies somewhat as you walk through the habitat. Um, and when you do this kind of research, you can identify rare um, neighbors or, and or associate species. So um, on the right here is the beautiful pawpaw or uh, Asimina, aka Deringothamnus pokellus. Um, and that's what it looks like in bloom. It really, really likes fire and it pretty much only blooms after a fire or a disturbance. But again, flatwoods aren't homogenous. So on the right here is um, same map you saw earlier, but you can see the variation within, um, within that habitat or within um, you know, those flatwoods just based on the aerial map. So the sandier areas are gonna have a slightly different species composition than the areas that are darker green or brown. And if we try to remember that these habitats are, are variable and have a wide amount of variation, we can think about um, how best to manage it. So one thing to remember is that, again, you know, we're losing species at a rapid pace. And a lot of that's due to land use change. Um, so the habitats that um, the species has been recorded in range from being um, G4S4, which is so globally it is ranked four, statewide it's ranked four, and that four, five is most secure, four is kind of, it's not like threatened, but it's like vulnerable. And then G2S2 is um, a step uh, below an endangered habitat or a step above an endangered habitat. So globally it's ranked two, statewide it's ranked two. So and on the right here, funny, funny joke, haha, of um, the MCORs toll roads that are being proposed, which I personally am uh, not in favor of them because those toll roads go over some of our last um, undeveloped wilderness that we have in Florida. And those are important for a wide variety of other reasons. So um, these kind, this kind of study or similar studies help identify key habitats for preservation of the species and can help inform the management of, you know, not just the species, but its habitat. So this is mainly to kind of think about things in a holistic manner. Um, because this species is um, found with a whole bunch of other different plants and some of them are listed species, if we think about what this milkweed needs and try to manage for this sensitive milkweed, we end up taking care of everything else in that habitat. So as an example of this, this is, a, this is the results of a burn 
that was uh, done in the late summer when wet season had re had, is really underway. And um, the results of this were that, you know, even though we had some species or some wiregrass still growing back, because of all the water on the ground, most of the plants that had been burned ended up drowning. So this results in, you know, if this happens consistently over time, you're, again, you're gonna see that shift of, um, you know, from one composition to another. And as I hopefully illustrated, that composition is really important for a lot of our, um, our native wildflowers and, you know, especially this species. And by extension, a lot of insects and animals too. This is, um, so compare that, a late wet season burn with a properly timed growing season burn. Huge difference, right? So this is, <laughs> I wanna thank you guys. I really appreciate you um, hanging out with me as I talk about this stuff. Um, Cause normally I wanna sit here and gush about this all day. Um, but here's some acknowledgements. I really appreciate y'all um, listening to this. And um, that said, questions. So, okay, so the first question that I see here, um, and I'll go through here. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat now. Um, so I brought a pot of upstate New York milkweed here after a freeze and germinated why? Um, so, um, I have attempted to grow milkweed species from other areas and um, some of those species probably require um, cold stratification um, where you kind of put them in a, a, a bag with a moist paper towel and stick them in the fridge for a few weeks um, and then after you take them out it should uh, increase germination rate. Um, another factor could be that you know the seeds were old and bad um, among other things. So there's a lot of um, reasons why uh, seeds might not germinate. But in general, milkweed seeds are, um, the proper term is recalcitrant, or um, more specifically in general terms, it means that unlike uh, certain species of plants where the seeds can lay dormant in the soil for like, you know, decades and decades and decades, or I don't know if some of you guys have seen the, um, seen some articles shared on Facebook of like, you know, uh, scientists germinating a 2000 year old date palm seed or, you know, seeds of, um, you know, a different species found in permafrost from a bazillion years ago. Milkweed seeds aren't like that. Um, they start rapidly losing viability after, you know, a year or two. So, um, and they tend to germinate uh, once conditions are good. Um, I, and that said, carnivorous milkweed, wish I, I don't know of any species that are carnivorous, but it would be really cool if there were. Um, there are species of milkweeds that grow with carnivorous plants, and that's actually probably like one of my top three, and that is um, Asclepius rubra or um, red milkweed. Um, that species grows in um, seepage um, bog seeps. And you often find it growing with pitcher plants, which is just super cool. Not to mention the fact that it has really pretty uh, bubblegum pink flowers that are just in a very gray, uh, gray sill look to it. Um, and Andrew asked, have you considered that a freshly burned area provides nutrients from the burned material and enhances productivity of successor plants? Absolutely. Um, there's there's a lot of really interesting research on um, fire response of different plants. There's some plants that, um, I, this is mostly species studied in Australia, but there's a bunch of spe uh, Australian species that actually have increased uh, germination of seeds after a fire due to, you know, smoke or ash. Um, and the smoke actually contains a chemical compound, um, what they call a keratin that mimics this kind of uh, naturally occurring growth hormone um, that occurs in most plants. So it's, it's really interesting um, on that front. But for um, milkweeds, what I've noticed, uh, the 
their response to fire tends to be like, oh, I'm missing my top. I should probably regrow and maybe the, it, there's enough space open for me to bloom. So I'm just going to do it. Um, the uh, plant that was in the, my fire ecology slide, um, that was pink. That's a grass pink orchid. And we have a species of grass pink orchid that literally only blooms after a fire. Nothing else can stimulate it to bloom except a burn. And it's probably likely that it's due to, you know, either that nutrient pulse or ash or, you know, leftover smoke bits that stimulates it to, to bloom and grow. So um, that's it. Any other questions? Uh, if no, there's no more questions, thank you all for attending, and I hope um, I hope this was informative.